Matthew 28 and verse 19 will be our text tonight. Go ye therefore, these are the words of Jesus, go ye therefore and teach all nations, discipling, rather, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Everybody say, end of the world. Of the world. One more time, end of the world. All right, so by end of the world, it's talking about the remotest part of the earth. <laughs> okay, what we're going to consider today is titled The History of Modern Missions. The History of Modern Missions. Basically, we want to see how Christianity in the last 200 years, thereabouts, began to spread to the ends of the earth. We want to see, especially the principal players. There are so many people who are responsible for all of these things we're going to discuss today. But we're just going to have about five of them. And the intention of this conversation is that you hear their stories and you are inspired. Just inspired. You know, the instructions of Jesus to his church, his apostles, his disciples, remains the same. We are still supposed to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Fortunately, there are, unfortunately, there are too many more Christians who are interested in taking their lives, their families to the ends of the earth for tourism, for relaxation, for japa, for a better life. But nobody's really thinking about, I want to obey Jesus and take the gospel to the ends of the earth. So, we hope that as you hear the stories of these ordinary men and women, ordinary people like me and you, young people, you'll be inspired. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us quickly pray. Holy Ghost, once again, we depend on the inspiration of your spirit. And this conversation counts because you breathe over them and you make them a fruitful vine in our souls in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for all trans. Thank you for clarity. Thank you for conviction and inspiration. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Okay. So what we read in Matthew 28 um, began to be executed or began to be um, obeyed as soon as Jesus sent down the Holy Ghost. We read in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 that one of the purposes of the Holy Ghost is that it would make witnesses who will take or will help spread the gospel from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and onto the uttermost part of the earth. The beginning of this spreading, we read in Acts chapter 7 and Acts chapter 8, especially once Stephen was persecuted and killed, the disciples began to spread because of the fear of persecution. Initially, the apostles had forgotten this instruction or did not take it seriously. Everybody settled in Jerusalem. Peter was the ogre over the church in Jerusalem. Same with James and John. They settled down there. Everybody was enjoying themselves. But once persecution began, you see, people began to, Stephen was killed and everybody began to travel, move on, move on, move on. It was not necessarily traveling to spread the gospel. It was traveling to escape persecution. Are we still together? Are we still together? I was thinking about it last week and I said, you know, there are many men of God going to many countries doing apostolic invasion, prophetic invasion, and all of that. And the intention is to take the gospel deliberately to those places. However, interestingly, God still used ordinary Christians who were just running away, just trying to survive, to spread the gospel. They were not necessarily trying to do invasion. They were not invading. They were just the fact, trying to save their soul from the terror of the Roman Empire. But God used their lives because their life was ultimately dedicated to the propagation of the gospel, whether they were deliberately trying to preach or they were just running away from evil. Everything about the early church was about spreading the gospel. Anywhere they went, they represented the gospel. And so, our biggest advantage in global evangelism 
is not necessarily even in deliberate missionary activities. It is not necessarily in invasions of new territories and lands. It is that our entire life must embody the gospel so that everywhere we find ourselves, if you relocate to Canada on the basis of getting a good job, who are you as Canada, you carry the gospel with you. Amen. Amen. If you go to Dubai on the basis of enjoying yourself with your family and enjoying a break from regular African life, you will still go with the gospel. Once the gospel is part of our DNA, everywhere we go, for whatever purpose, we are still going to propagate the gospel. And you see, once we install that kind of a mindset, it will be easy to fulfill the instructions of Matthew 28 and verse 20, to take the gospel to all the ends of the earth. So subsequently, they began to spread, began to spread, the gospel went to the Gentiles, we saw Philip preach in Samaria, that's in Acts chapter 8. We saw Cornelius' house opened up to the gospel through the ministry of Peter. And I saw Apostle Paul began to take the gospel to the Gentiles in a very aggressive manner. And all the things we have been teaching you since Church History 1 was to show you how Christianity evolved from that point till the present time. We saw how there was a little respite because of the help of Constantine, who was like a governor or actually you can say president or king who who respected the Christian faith and so he banned the persecution of Christianity or persecution of Christians and encouraged people to be Christians. Now that particular event where the government and the church was now working together did some good to the church but in my opinion it seemed to do a whole lot of damage And that information is very important to the conversation we are having now. We are talking about the history of modern missions. And by missions, we are talking about spreading the gospel into territories, lands, countries. Are we still together? But modern missions differ from ancient missions. And one of the ways, critical ways it differs is that Asian mission, and by Asian mission, I'm talking about everything that happened from the era of Constantine. That kind of missionary activity was state-sponsored. That means that anybody preaching the gospel of Jesus was guaranteed security. If you go to Spain, police will escort you. And so most of their preaching was not necessarily the way Jesus taught us to preach. Jesus didn't tell us to preach by saying, when you go to a country, tell them, if you don't give your life to Christ, we'll kill all of you. Mm -mm. But that was, you see, state-sponsored gospel actually compromises the efficacy of the gospel. What I mean is that when the government is now the one backing the spread of the gospel, there is already a compromise to the message. Because if they obey the government, not because of Jesus, but because of threats, from the government, it is not really going to produce a real disciple. Are we still together here? Come on, are we still together? Yeah. Let me rephrase. The topic is what? So, in explaining and understanding history of or uh, understanding the modern missions, I'm trying to juxtapose, I'm trying to compare the ancient missionary activities. And by ancient, I don't mean Paul and Peter. Paul and Peter preached the real gospel. But after that time, there was a collaboration between the government and the church. So most of the missionary activities were not necessarily authentic missionary activities. I mean that many of the foreign missionary trips that the church of that age partook in was actually sponsored by the government. And so they went with military force. They went with sword. They went with shield. They weren't threatening people to submit to Christ. Not all the time, but most of the time. Even in the times of the Reformation, like the times of Martin Luther, that period evolved into yet another government-church collaboration. However, once we get into the 17th and 18th century, particularly with the revivals that took place under the Wesley era, And of course, like we studied the Second Great Awakening, the church was completely separated from the government. So anybody involved in missionary activities was not going to be sponsored by government. If you want to do missions, it's because you want to obey Jesus. 
Are we still together here? So modern missions is very, very, um, it's a very interesting and intriguing conversation and it differs greatly from Asian missions because you can say that modern mission is actually more authentic than ancient missions because Asian missions were backed by government forces. Not all of them, but the bulk of what was happening in most of those countries, particularly where the Roman Catholic Church was established or the Eastern Orthodox Church was established, it was not really about just the gospel of Jesus because it was government-backed and many of those evangelical outreaches were done with a sense of conquering nations for civilizations, not necessarily for Jesus. So there was already a corruption in the gospel. Are we still together here? Yeah. So what we are discussing today um, was like, or is like a return to the original template of missionary activities. And um, so many people that God used, so many people that God used um, to eventually allow the gospel spread all over the earth. Even though, unfortunately, we still have so many people that are not reached with the true gospel. For instance, in Africa, let me just give a thorough explanation again to buttress this point. Some people brought the gospel, as it were, but what they were actually trying to do was to teach the people of Africa the ways of Europe, the ways of America, the ways of Britain. Although they came with Bible and came with cross, there was an ulterior motive to their intention. Are we still together here? So we, we must separate real missions from fake missions. There are a lot of fake missions that have happened throughout history, a lot of fake missions. People carry the Bible and say, let's go there. Meanwhile, what they want to actually do is to collect more slaves, to enslave a race, and they're using Bible to do it. We saw how people were using Bible verses to support slavery and all of that. So, but we are really concerned about the authentic works of modern missionaries and by modern, we don't mean anybody in the 20th or 21st century. We are looking at the 18th century and the 19th century especially. Are we still together here? Yeah. So, I'll just read a couple of names and then explain some of their lives and ministries and I will draw inspiration from them. The first person we want to talk about is a young man, David Brainerd. David Brainerd. You like him, have you? Ladies, unlike uh, Charles Finney that you were shouting about, this one looks a little bit cuter. It's just because maybe the person that dream, dream well, maybe just a clearer picture, doesn't mean he was more handsome. Uh, of course, he was young. He actually lived a very short life. Everybody said 29. That's when he died. <laughs> it's not how long you live, it is how well you live. <laughs> And yet, he's one of the greatest influencers of Christian missions in the history of the Christian faith. And he lived to only 29. <laughs> His life is such an inspiration. Interestingly, it is not even about... See, David Brainerd's life is not, not, not really about his success at missionary activities. What makes David Brainerd a spectacle to the Christian faith or of the Christian faith is the documentations of his struggles. He had a journal where he wrote down all the things he went through. He actually died of sickness, tuberculosis. And in between all of that, he suffered several things. Hunger, depression, loneliness, and he was always writing. Everything he went through, he would write it. And in the day he died, that journal was the greatest blessing that came with his life. Not necessarily his life, but his documentations of his struggles. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, we always think that there's only good testimonies that can inspire. Say, so share with us how somebody that should three million naira. Share with us how your result changed from F to A. Miraculously. It's good, good test. But you see, God can use even the bad times of his servants to inspire a generation. A man died 29 of tuberculosis, and yet he is one of the greatest source of inspiration to the Christian mission execution. Now, it, it just shows that, like I always say, what God can do with a man's life, you can never know. 
cannot. You may think a man was a failure. Wow, oh, 29. He died young. Ah, Satan took his life. You can say many things. But God can still work with that life. That's why I am tired of Christians not understanding that indeed believers don't die, they sleep. And even when you say sleep, it's still a technical term. Because this man is not sleeping. Anybody who grabs his biography and reads it, and if you want to, I'm, I'm warning you, let me warn you, don't read it. If you read it, you may quit school and go to Sudan. See, it's all people's life. <laughs> they are triggers. Ah. If you read this life, if you read this life journal, you ask yourself, you tell yourself, I'm wasting my time. What, what, what am I doing in school? See human be here. And I'm not just talking about some, some blabbing. These are people, I've heard crazy testimonies about his life. Snake will walk on his back and dry up. And this people did not even emphasize miracles. He died of sickness. Because in that time, the revelation of healing was not really solid. And of course, caravanism was still a strong thing. Sovereignty of God, whatever happens, happens. But the kind of things these people did with their little knowledge and their little days, 29 years old. Ask your neighbor again, how old are you? <laughs> Let's read a little bit about David Brenner here. Born in 1718, his father, Ezekiah Brenyard, died when David was nine. His mother, Dorothy, who was a daughter of a reverend, also died when he was 14. So he was an orphan. So he was 14. <laughs> However, he had a strict religious training. Bible reading, prayer, Sabbath observance, and Christian books were things that he exposed his mind to from a child. But he was not converted until he was 21. Everybody say 21 to 29. How many years is that? Eight years. It's not how long, it's how well. Eight years. And today, in 2023, we're still talking about him. Let me bring that. Ah. <laughs> I read these things and I tell myself, I say, oh boy, <laughs> I have not started. My life must count for something. Beyond my generation. He was converted in a very remarkable way. He seemed to see a vision, as it were. And according to him, he said, I was swallowed in God. A new peace engulfed me. Joy overwhelmed me. And he was certain that he was a new creature in Christ. This was when he was 21. Now, he entered the university or the college, Yale College. And at that age of 21, he was a little bit way older than the normal college student. Most of the students at that time were about 13 to 17. Have you ever experienced those um, daddy Agba in school? So you, they are your classmates, but you say that you will be kissing your uncle. uncle. You know, because even though they are your classmates, you know that. <laughs> you may be classmates, you are not age mates. <laughs> so Bernard was like that. At 21, of course, because he was an orphan, there was poverty, he couldn't even afford school, but he eventually entered Yale at age 21. Are we still together here? Yeah. And during that time, the preachings of George Whitefield was really trending. And um, the Great Awakening was already in full force at that time. So many communities experienced revival, and some of the students at Yale University uh, this is a very important or a, a very important information. I want you to take note of it. Some of the students at the university became very excited because of the new revelations that they obtained from the revival movement. This excitement, however, made many of them arrogant. Have you ever been under a minister preaching and you, you seem to know more than, more than the preacher? They are the preacher. I can, I, I can, I can use them more than you. So there was like an arrogance in many of those students because although revival was spreading, but many of their leaders, of course, Yale University was like a Christian university. Many of their leaders were still the same old set of people who probably had not embraced the new truth that was becoming a trend in those days. Well, in 1741, yeah, um, David Brenner rather had to withdraw from school 
because he was sick. And the first signs of tuberculosis began to show in his life. But he was able to return. Now, during that time where he withdrew, he suffered great times of depression. But he was able to return to Yale and focus on his studies. He was the head of his class, maybe because of his, of his age, but he was also a brilliant young man. And as the head of his class, he was very vocal. He did not like the way many of the teachers of his class did their spiritual devotion. Once again, once again, you may recollect hearing a prayer by an aged person, and you're feeling like, this is my back, I cannot pray. See how he's praying. Koni anointing. Koni rema. Koni rev. That was the situation the rebellion found himself. He was a very devout spiritual person, but many of his lecturers were not devout. Well, <laughs> one day a lecturer led the prayer, and somebody asked him about the prayer. What do you have to say about that man that prayed? And the rebellion said, Let me write, let me quote it the way. <laughs> It is written a very funny statement. It says, A chair, I mean plastic chair, has more grace than him. <laughs> well, uh, arrogance can make you say stupid things. Uh, this is a very sober warning. So, people who catch Rema, catch Rev, and feel like they are better than their fathers. You know? Recently, I had to scold one of my mentors who was going, you know, to speak evil about a man of God. And I said, you, you, may, not, you, you may even know better than him, but then it's not in your place to talk like this. You don't talk like this. You don't, and you know, in Nigeria, we, we practice selective hypocrisy. I told him, I said, this is what you are saying, that uh, this man said this. First of all, you didn't even know the whole context of the message. You can't get the context because some of these media men just pick headlines and lie. You don't just, you don't just buy any stupid thing somebody says on the media. But some of your fathers of your God general have said worse than this. Eh? If I show you some videos of some of your God general, I will compare to the rest of the Bible. So, but there is this arrogance amongst young people. Once you, you know something a little bit better, you just feel like, ah! How can you say a chair has more grace than a man of God? A boy issue. The insult of demons. For those of you who may not understand my awkward Yoruba. But they were burning at somebody, you know all those gossipers or gossips. Somebody now heard the statement. I went to report. Say, come, I have something to tell you. One student here said that. One of our lecturers, grace of cheer, plenty passing room. So they expelled the Rebrenard from Yale University. <laughs> he begged and begged and begged. He was very remorseful in his personal writings. He documented the fact that he regretted what he said, but they would not take him back. Are we still together? Yes, Bernard was devastated by this action, and even though he asked forgiveness, and even men like Jonathan Edwards begged on his behalf. He was never reinstated into college. And so he could not graduate. In those days, if you didn't graduate from Yale University or some universities like Harvard, Oxford, Yale, you will not be, you will not be given a license to preach in some places. You cannot be a preacher. You must go through certain trainings from some institutions. So that means his ministry hope was also dashed. Are we still together? Yeah. But even if the world rejects a man, if God wants to use a man, he goes to use him. If God wants to use a man, he goes to use him. Since churches were not going to permit him to preach, he had to now look away from preaching in regular churches and look towards Christian missions. He had to now think about being a missionary. Are we still together here? Yeah. Since he could not preach. In churches, yesterday I said, Okay, I must do ministry, I must serve this Jesus. And that's a challenge to some of you. Because some of you, the reason why you are not serving Jesus is not because your university expelled you or because church will not allow you. Is that you have no interest. If I'm this man, I'm, 
I probably will say, ah, maybe it's my destiny not to be a minister. Kim also, I said, the man no get grace. Say, cheer, get grace. Person. It's not true. I beg that this church we are too strict. I will get angry with church, get angry with Bible, get angry with God. I say, I'm not doing But this man's passion was so overwhelming, he insisted, if I cannot do church, I will go to villages and serve my Jesus there. So he went to minister to the Indian Americans close to Pennsylvania. And that's where he began to do his missionary activity. Okay, let me skip a few things and progress because of time. David Brenner's central message was the cross of Jesus. However, he suffered greatly in the course of missionary work. Often beaten by heavy rain and snow, he slept in the forest with little or no protection. A very inadequate diet left him frequently weakened. Long sessions of fasting and prayer fed his soul but weakened his body. The long weeks on horsebacks of foot, living under very primitive conditions, were most difficult. So his ministry was accompanied with consistent illness and sickness, alongside depression and loneliness. Brenyard, however, was also frustrated because most of the people he was preaching to did not respond well to his messages. In July of that particular year, I'm talking about 1745, Brenard wrote, My soul, my very soul, longs for the ingathering of the heathen, and I cry to God most willingly and heartily. However, in August 8, 1745, the windows of heaven opened and revival fell to those he was ministering to. So he was a bit happy, at least there was some fruit to his labor. But then his health kept deteriorating, kept deteriorating. The revival brought him some joy, some happiness. But subsequently, he could no longer minister. And so he was sent to the house of Jonathan Edwards to recover. That was where he actually died at age 29. Very brief life. So his emphasis or our emphasis is not necessarily his life. Jonathan Edwards, however, noticed that David Brenard walked around with his diary. And so he began to look into it. And then he picked it up after his death and began to publish some of the writings in this journal. He will publish them and add commentaries to them. His, his journals did not just document the good times, because for most of the Brenner's life, there was sorrow, there was loneliness, there was bitterness, there was depression. There were a few joys from revival, but, but what made his writings to become an inspiration to a generation was that people saw that there is not one single excuse not to be a missionary. Somebody suffering from tuberculosis. Somebody expelled from school because of his zeal. Yet, continued in the preaching and teaching of the word of God. Somebody did not see any results after preaching to people. Yet, continued until revival broke out. When people read of his story, it broke all their excuses. All the words they gave as excuses. Now, of course, we saw last week, and I should say this, that... In the era where Calvinism was very prominent, well, some hyper-Calvinists, let me use the word hyper-Calvinist, just like we have grace, we also have hyper-grace. Is that not so? Yes, Are we still together? Yes, so, let me say this. It's not every Calvinist that opposed preaching the gospel. It's not like that. In fact, many missionaries were Calvinists in their beliefs. I've told you John Wesley was a Calvinist. John Whitefield was a Calvinist. Jonathan Edwards was a Calvinist. Okay? But they were hyper Calvinists who did not um, you know, respond well to the call of God to preach the gospel. They just felt, well, anybody that is born again, 
is somebody that has been born again from the foundation of the earth. So if they are saved, they are saved. There's nothing we can do to affect that. However, there was now a growing mentality in the Christian community against mission activity. And many people gave excuses of, oh, we can't travel to these places. It's too difficult. By the way, in those days, medicine was not really advanced. So little sicknesses could kill. For instance, when we begin to discuss missionaries in Africa, malaria killed a lot of people. Malaria shouldn't be shaky. Malaria. Malaria that you take, you have and drink water and then sleep. It killed missionaries like, like no man's business. So many people were afraid, ah, this disease of this place, Asia, Africa, if we go there, we will die. But when they read David Brenner's story, that a man suffering from tuberculosis still labored, 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 labored till he died. It broke their hearts. And they began to yield to the call of missions. Are we still together here? So that's, that's the real thing I want to say about David Brenner's life. That it is not necessarily his life that inspired, but the documentations in his journals that Jonathan Edward picked up and published now stirred up a generation towards missions. However, let me read some of his quotes and some of his quotations that um, over the years have been quoted. This one says, I love to live on the brink of eternity. May I never loiter in my heavenly journey. All my desire was the converse, conversion of the heathen and all hope was in God. I want to wear out my life in his service and for his glory. Let me forget the world and be swallowed up in the desire to glorify God. All I want to be, or rather, all I want is to be more holy, more like my dear Lord. And we can go on and on and on. All of these things, you can read them in his diary. I am warning you, if you read it, if you read it, uh, you may get into holy trouble. But uh, I think that if you want to have an exciting Christian life, some of these things, you cannot escape them. Amen. Amen. Okay. Let me progress. Now, David Brenner's life, of course, had a ripple effect on several other missionaries. Some of them we're about to learn from. But let me progress to the next person here because of time. Let's talk about James Hudson Taylor. He's the founder of China Inland Missions. Basically, most of his work was in China. I know that you may not see China as a great Christian country, but I'm telling you that the kind of things happening on the ground in China is massive, but you may not know. And it's, many of these things are traced to this man's labors, or Taylor, who founded the China Inland Mission International. Okay, let me read a few things about his life so that we can appreciate his life and ministry. Are we still together here? He was born in May 21, 1832, into a family that prayed together and spoke often of other countries that had not heard the word of God. You see, family conversations can sow seeds into the heart of children. In his family, they often spoke about countries that had not heard God's word. And when they spoke about it, they prayed about it. Maybe they had a, a, a world map, and they spoke, say, in this country, you have not heard the gospel. It was a common, frequent conversation in the family. So, from a child, Ochintelo was aware of the gospel. But when he was 17, <laughs> he said he doesn't want to be a Christian again. This, this, this story is similar to many of us. There is an innocent age where you are a product of your parents' investment. Then one day you eat of the tree of the good of, of the knowledge of good and evil. Your eyes will open. I want to be a pilot. <laughs> you have become aware. Yeah, but most times, most times, with prayers, that seed will germinate. Most times. <laughs> if, they, if they push it through in prayers, the seed sown in the heart of the innocent child, they will germinate. So about 17, well, he was not interested again in this Christian um, life. But he read a book, or I think a tract now. So let me just read it as it's written here, please. 
During this time, Ossintelio and his friends were skeptical of Christianity and turned off by the inconsistency of Christian people who claimed to believe the Bible but were yet content to live just as they would if there was no Bible. What does that mean? Ossintelio, childhood was pro-Christian, but when they began to you see knowledge, exposure, began to observe the hypocrisy of Christians, they felt like, maybe it's a scam. These people claim that they live by the Bible, or they claim to believe in the Bible, but their life and the Bible does not match. And we have lost many people because of our hypocrisy. We read about Charles Finney last week. There are many hypocrites who do damage to the cause of the gospel. If you believe or if you profess that you believe in the Bible, please let your life show it. Because some conversions are dependent on that. Amen. Amen. But Taylor's mother, or St. Taylor's mother and sister, continually prayed for him. And then subsequently he read a tract and it changed his heart and brought him back into salvation or brought him salvation as it were. Okay. Let me just progress to the conversation. I will find more useful here. His family, of course, was very poor, but he took interest in the Chinese people and then decided he was going to be a missionary to China. Um, he sailed to the city of Shanghai in March 1, 1853. Let me read a few things here. As he spent time studying the language, he saw that many missionaries of his day had adopted rich lifestyles and that few had gone further inland to the rural and poorer areas. Some people say they are missionaries. Say they are. <laughs> but when you see what they are doing, <laughs> you know, this one is Faji missionary. Some people only want to be missionaries to Canada, Lagos, Las Vegas. <laughs> I'm an apostle to the city of Lagos. Lagos, I'm coming for you with the grace of God. Because Mozambique, they don't need the grace of God for there. Zimbabwe, grace of God, you know, you know, land for there. And it's not a new thing. Many people claim to be laboring for Christ, but they're laboring for their stomach. So Austin Taylor noticed that even in China, many of the so-called missionaries adopted rich lifestyles, and only few had gone into the extremely poor areas. After six months, he moved to a little house where he could get to know his Chinese neighbors. Austin Taylor was so passionate about converting the indigents that he would do everything, everything to convert, including living with them, wearing their clothes, learning their languages, speaking their language, anything, eating their food. The missionary mentality is like that. When I see somebody say he has a call to be apostolic, he has apostolic call, actually the closest word to apostle is actually missionary in the real sense of it. It is the sent one, the sent. Apostolic is sent. So when you say somebody is a missionary, in fact, it's probably more apostolic than your favorite apostle. Yeah. Especially when he's obsessed with the gospel of Jesus. To those, you see, one of the signs of an apostle is that they want to preach to those that have not heard the gospel. Why is somebody an apostle and he only goes to where he's establishing churches where there are churches? There are no churches here. You go to build like another one. It says apostolic mandate. These people have heard, it is almost a bond over districts, like we read last week, they have heard, heard, heard. You still say, yeah, it is you that God sent you, it is them that God sent you to. Why don't you go to, Paul says, I made up my mind, I was not going to preach the gospel where it has been preached already. I will go to a prison where they have never heard it. That's the missionary apostolic mentality. Back to what's in Taylor, He noticed, however, that when the Chinese people saw him, they saw him as an outsider because he was not part of them. So he began to now tell himself, until they see me, and all these things are principles of 
missions that new missionaries or modern missionaries have learned and they learn from people like this until they see me as part of them they are not going to hear me out this is it it's just like an african thinking that an oibo man is a colonizer so if i see you bible i'll say you want to colonize me hmm. they have to, my grandfather warned me that when i see oibo man even if you hold bible na lie you na colonizer you won't carry me go you do slave trade so there was already a mentality about foreigners in those lands until you identified with them learning their language eating their food dressing like them many of them will not accept however as simple as that wisdom was many missionaries did not adopt it in fact they laughed and mocked at Orson Taylor I mean his colleagues American and British people when they saw that he was dressing like the Chinese I have a picture of him here of him dressed in Chinese attire I'm not saying dressing for Fajio I'm not saying you now wear their clothes just to do photo shoot I mean you wear their clothes how many of you can wear skirts guys but if you are if you are an apostle to Scotland you must wear skirts how many of you ladies can wear a job if you are an apostle or apostles to Saudi Arabia, you must wear a jab. You see, you, these are the things we, we don't teach our people. Somebody now go to uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. You see, I'm a preacher. She's a woman. She, she now goes like a madi. Leave her hair like this. <laughs> she may spend her years in jail. Because there is a principle that in converting the heathen, you must find the cultural common ground that you can use to meet them. There's a cultural common ground. And that's one of the things that the Ministry of Austin Taylor really buttressed. Okay. Um, there's so much to say, but we don't have time. In 1865, Austin Taylor founded the China Inland Mission. He knew there were millions of people who needed to hear the message of Jesus and thus named the mission magazine China's Millions. It is published today as East Asia's Millions. So you can Google East Asia's Millions. It is actually an offshoot or an evolution of China's Millions that Hudson Taylor started. Are we still together here? Yeah. While stressing the need to preach widely, Hudson Taylor urged local churches to establish and mature for church buildings to be of Chinese, not foreign design. The idea of missionary before Austin Taylor's principle was that you carry American building concept and go and build inside China. You carry American clothes. And that's why the gospel was not like a cultural message, not necessarily a universal message. This is why the gospel was rejected, because it looked like people were just looking for a way to colonize us. But as you see him in Chinese society, he began to choose, oh no, these churches must be built like Chinese churches. Must be run. See, see, you know, this same thing. I don't know why we do it. If I go abroad, if for any reason God send me to Canada to start a church, amen, I won't go there and be saying, Jo, Jo, Ijo, Jesu. Or what's that song of Perez? In Canada. What, what, what are we doing? That's why you see many so called. Nigerian pastors, when they go there, you see that it's still Nigerians that follow them. It's Nigerians that attend the churches in Canada. I was watching somebody complain about this. Uh, he went to a church in London and the woman was giving testimony. And the woman was saying, Oh, do a leg on that bridge in London. <laughs> you now expect a, a white man to attend the church. Why would he attend? It's a racist church. It's a racist church, obviously. The choir comes and says, Oh, Lord, in London. That's not apostolic Christianity. It's, it's very easy to convert Christianity to a cultural, a cultural religion. You just turn to your village people religion. I tell some of our folks who leave the country and go abroad, I say, please, when you get there, don't look for Nigerian church. Why would you leave here? You, you have been in Nigeria all your life. You live here. You now go there. You say, I look for Nigerian church. You know, the pastor is Tunde, Idiagmo. What? Are you trying to say that there are no other Christians? There are no Christians from other countries. But many, many of us have local, village mentality when it comes to Christianity. 
And these are the things that I tell them what you say, no, we are a missionary. You don't, you don't bring your own personal culture, your own village life into another person's village. Do things in their own village way, but in a way that still fits into the scriptures. Amen. Amen. So he insisted, the buildings must be Chinese, not foreign designs. The leaders of the churches should be Chinese Christians. Why would churches go abroad and look for Nigerian pastors to end abroad churches? And we say we are, we are propagating the gospel. We are propagating Nigeria. What? We, are, we become Nigerian ambassadors. What Christian ambassadors? If your gospel cannot convert to Yubo, it's not the gospel. Leave it. I'm not putting the gospel. Forget this. I'm not putting the gospel. If it's only a gospel that fits into the black man scenario, it's not the gospel. It's the gospel for every nation, every tribe, every tongue. But most of us, we like to play convenience. And that's why most of our church planting strategy is rubbish. Listen, if I'm going to plant a church in Canada, and almost every denomination, maybe including my own denomination, is guilty. It's not that we will go there and be looking for people that we, our church members, before in Nigeria, who have now been to Canada. That's a wrong approach. I dare not save people in Canada that we can talk to. When I'm sending text message, do you know that there's now a chapel in Canada? Do you know that you can't try? Why? Why? See, it's like me coming to Gomosha and I'm looking for uh, uh, all the people that, uh, are, you know, they were Ramites in Lagos, Ramites in the who have now come to Gomosha. Please, we also have branch. It's, it's rubbish. Are there no people here who we can reach out to? Are we still together here? So, all of these principles. We are learning them to see a better approach to converting the world and evangelizing the globe. I can keep ranting and ranting on, so let me just <laughs> let me just move ahead here. Austin Taylor was known as a man of prayer, just as he learned the power of prayer through his mother and sister. Also known as a man of faith, he would respond that he was only a servant of a faithful God. But Taylor died on June 3rd, 1905, and was buried in Changsha. <laughs> of course, that's in China. Even though he was American, because of his missionary dedication to China, everything about his life, as it were, revolved around the Chinese people. And he's such a great legacy for. Christian missions. Okay, let us progress here. We'll just pick a few lessons. We cannot really really stay with them. Just pick a few lessons from their lives and move on. Let's talk about what should we do? Let's do William Carey who is described as the father of modern missions. William Carey. Quite a very interesting man. <laughs> At age 14, he was a shoemaker. At age 17, he accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. But he combined his ministry work with shoemaking just to ensure that he can still fend for his family and take care of himself. He studied scriptures in their original languages. He himself by himself, for himself, through himself, taught himself Greek and Hebrew. He discovered that he seemingly had a special power of learning languages very easily. This man, William Carey. So he taught himself Greek and Hebrew, and Isaiah became one of his favorite, if not his favorite book. He frequently preached from Isaiah 54, which was actually like a missionary sermon. He basically always encouraged his audience to preach the gospel and to live the gospel. Carey felt that missionary enterprise is the church's highest and holiest endeavor. He preached his first sermon in the meeting house in Ackleton, in the same village that he had his first shoemaker shop. May 21, 1791, he was ordained to the pastorate of the chapel in Leicester. And he published a little journal titled An Inquiry into the Obligations of Christians 
to use means for the conversion of the heathens. That particular journal, just like the journal of David Brennan, is also a very important book in the history of Christian missions, and it has also stirred up the heart of many people towards global evangelism. Are we still together? <laughs> he is also renowned for a statement in one of his sermons preached May 31, 17, okay, no, yeah, 1792. The statement goes thus, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. How many of you have heard that statement before? Okay, some of you might have not, but it's a very common motivational quote or spiritual motivational quote. Expect great things from God, receive great things from God, expect little from God, receive little from God. Okay, this is maybe... <laughs> Um, an edit of the statement, but the two phrases that have been or that have stood out throughout um, the study of his life is expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. After he preached this sermon with compassion concerning missions, <laughs> nobody seemed to be moved. I've been there before to preach and sweat. And you'll be asking, am I even called? And when you cry, say, oh, people are dying. People are dying. And then who's it? So your time is up. Ah. But it was not deterred. The passion for missions remained in his soul. Are we still together here? June 1, 1792, Carrie presented his idea to a group of ministers concerning the establishment of a missionary society. One of the group members, an older man, spoke back and said, let me quote him. Young man, sit down. When God pleases to convert the hidden, he will do it without your help or my help. Once again, this was a Calvinistic mentality. They didn't believe that God needed us to preach the gospel. Anybody that will be saved, his name must be written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. So it seemed like William Carey, is his name William Carey? Was alone <laughs> on this matter of his mission or his passion for missions. However, he met another minister, Andrew Fuller, and they seemed to gel together and seemed to share the goal of reaching the world with the gospel. Okay. Subsequently, they formed a missionary society. And, of course, we have several missionary societies after that, but this particular one seemed to be a turning point in the history of missions. The name was the Particular Baptist Society for the Propagation of the Gospel Among the Hidden. Quite a long name. <laughs> they made the following resolution. Humbly desirous of making an effort for the propagation of the gospel among the hidden according to the recommendation of Carrie's inquiry. We... Okay, I can go on and on. Let me just move on, please. Let me just move on. Are we still together? Okay. Well, there are major or his major place of ministry was India. Everybody say India. I want to love India movies. If you love India movies, please also know William Carey. So that's a... Let me say that film you can't live your life for. Give me a few seconds here, please. This is a very interesting read. The first party arrived in Kolkata, November 11, 1793. There were many discouragements. But they encouraged themselves with scriptures. The missionaries soon organized the church with William Carey as pastor. They continued to pray for their first convert. One promising inquirer, a Mohammedan, which is, in a sense, a Muslim, expressed faith, but disappeared before his baptism. The, once again, it's just to show how even the great missionaries had failures. Imagine you 
entered India. You pray, 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 pray. One person now showed up. The day of his baptism, he no come. You say, I no do again. Uh, if you give up too soon, your success story will never be told. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I was telling the guys in the school of ministry, we're watching the video of um, Charles and Francis Hunter, great healing evangelist. The first five people they prayed for died. And yet they are perhaps the greatest healing couple in ministry in our generation. But the first five people they prayed for died. If you give up, your success story will not be told. However, one day a Hindu named Krishna Pal came to the compound with a dislocated shoulder. I'm saying this information because I want to link this with how William Carey introduced medical care to missionary activities. Are we still together? So this guy came with a dislocated shoulder. The missionary immediately summoned John Thomas, who was a medical doctor, to help with medical emergency. Carey and others assisted by bracing and holding the injured man against the tree while Thomas relocated the shoulder without the benefit of anesthesia. That means it was very, very painful. Amen. The grateful man, Krishna Pal, now agreed to listen to the gospel. After they repaired your shoulder, I said, Oh, yeah. This is Jesus when I talk. Make a <laughs> yeah. Now, I have to admit that, you see, God will always use what you have in opening up the world to the gospel. However, however, we must not see secondary tools as the gospel. If you are a medical person, it can be a tool, a secondary tool to open up a place. By showing compassion to people, people can now listen to the gospel. That can be a tool. But you must not make that the ultimate tool of conversion. Amen. Amen. So, only after they were able to repair his shoulder, did he listen to the gospel. And eventually, he became the first convert, their first convert, after several months. Carrie had a son, his name Felix. He was thinking that this Felix would join him in missionary labor. But the guy said he would rather become. A special agent to the British government. Once again, if God calls you, God calls you alone. Oh, amen. amen. Waiting for partners, saying, waiting for collabo, you may not see. God called me. If my wife say, God no call me, we could no for some. If parents say, God no call them, we could no for some. You don't have to impose ministry on your family. Imp you can teach Christianity but don't impose ministry. So this man was heartbroken. Look at what he said. My son has chosen to be an ambassador of the king of England when he could have as well become an ambassador of the king of kings. He paid now. But as well I be. <laughs> Are we still together here? Yeah? Once again, so much to say, but let me just tie this up under William Carey's ministry. Carey had a consuming concern for the souls of men. By the way, he also suffered many sicknesses. In fact, he had to shuffle, travel to England, return back to India many times. Was he the one? Yes, he lost his wife to mental illness and about three of his children. Missionary work is very, is, it, it takes a toil. It's a whole lot, really. I would say it emphatically, missionaries are the greatest heroes of the Christian faith. Not pastors, not preachers, not modern apostles. Most of us don't sacrifice anything compared to what these guys suffer. <laughs> Imagine traveling to India and your wife became mad the next day. And had to live with that until she died. Maybe because she was scared. Maybe because she was afraid. But the work of God has to just go on. It has to go on. Are we still together here? It was in India for 40 years. Died in June 9, 1834. Unfortunately, William Carey's church in Leicester currently 
is now an Hindu temple. Some of you don't understand because you're not listening. For somebody to serve God first in Leicester, then went to become a missionary in India so that he can preach the gospel of Jesus and the power of Hinduism will be broken. And then after, after all those labor, the church he started from now became an Hindu temple. It must hurt him. In heaven, it must hurt him. But once again, it shows that if there's no continuity, all your works can waste. All your works can waste. Hallelujah. All right, let's do two more. I don't have time, and I think that when we get to the last person, it's a little bit more interesting. So let's consider the man David Livingstone. David Livingstone was inspired by David Brainerd, born in March 19, 1813. He was not really poor per se. <laughs> At least he was able to afford some basic form of um, education. And his mind was exposed to a lot of explorative books. David Livingstone is a controversial figure because. Some will believe he was just an explorer, not a missionary. <laughs> but from all the studies I've done, he was a missionary who failed. In fact, somebody said he only had one convert in all his years. And that convert returned back to serve idols. The story is very interesting because he was a missionary to Africa. He was he's perhaps, he's perhaps the greatest missionary to Africa. But some will believe that he was not really a missionary, he was just an explorer. But I'll say a few things that will give you a proper perspective. From childhood, he was exposed to books that encouraged an explorative mind. He had, as it were, a missionary spirit. He was also um, a very hard-working person. From age 10, he began to work. He worked from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. And he used the money to learn. He learned Latin and a few other languages. He volunteered to work in London Missionary Society for Service in China. But at that time, the nation of China was not opening himself up to foreigners because there was a war. So they told him to go to West Indies instead. But he also could not go. So eventually, he decided to go to Africa, South Africa, to be precise. Are we still together here? Yes, so, there was, in South Africa, it was really an adventure. When he went to Africa, this story I'm about to read is very interesting, so let me just go through it. He was the only one with, or he was the only one with a gun. <laughs> and one of the people that he worked with in Africa were exposed to wild animals. There was a time lions came to attack the people he was working with. And so he shot the lion. The lion, however, grabbed his shoulder. <laughs> the bullets hit the lion. But, you know, last bite. Like you kill me, I must kill you too. <laughs> it died there, but the mark was still on him till he, di till he died. That mark <laughs> of being beaten with, by a lion was there. After this event, he was sent to go and recuperate, and then that's where he met his wife, the nurse that nursed him. You know, I think that happened to John Wesley. Was it John Wesley? Or... <laughs> Nurses, they are very interesting people. I always tell people in medical line, if you're a lady, eh? actually, if you're a lady and you're a doctor or a nurse, if you don't control your emotions, you'll fall in love with your patients. I'm telling you, it's not. It's because there seems to be an innate nurturing thing about a woman. Listen to me. If, if you don't like somebody, eh? listen, are you listening to me? Yeah. Ladies, if you don't like somebody and you are thinking of the person, it's a matter of time you fall in love with the person. You see, that's why people say, I don't even know why I like, I don't even know why I married him. You don't know why. You were cooking for him. You were washing his clothes. 
There's something about there's something about caring for 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 ladies. I'm not for ladies. When you put your care into somebody, even the person is a malu. You fall in love. It's a man of time. So that's why many ladies eventually don't marry the people that they love. They marry people that they take care of. Yeah. I, I, I say, ladies, say, I don't like him. I'm just taking care of him. <laughs> when the wedding invitation come out, invite me. I will come and eat rice. You're just taking care of him. You don't know you're investing emotions into him. That's, the woman was wired to nurture. That's the same principle that makes a, a mother nurture a baby. The, the baby may not be fine in the eyes of another person, but I, I will not talk that child. That's, just, it's, that's the way women were designed. Amen. Amen. Because I mentioned that we talk, we talk. We don't talk love talk for you. But I just have to mention that <laughs> to speak about the believing stones, marriage, and all of that. Well, living stone, like I said, seemed to fail as a missionary, was frustrated by the lack of response that most of the indigents of Africa showed to him. That time Africa was called the white man graveyard. They were very terrible names. It was also called the dark continent. By the way, I saw a picture of, from outer space on the continent of Africa. Africa is really a dark continent. It's not just the color of our skin. There's no light. <laughs> you see, and you can Google it, you can see continental pictures of other places in Asia. You see it lit up. You see light. If you take a drone footage of Oyo State, you will not see you. Maybe it's only government house, you see, don't have light. By the way, despite his failure, one of the things that he advocated for strongly was the abolition of slave trade. And he, he thought that there's no way slave trade was going to be abolished until Africans learned the power of commerce and trade. You have things you can sell. You don't have to sell human beings. So he, he seemingly changed his emphasis from direct preaching to encouraging the people of Africa to learn trade, learn commerce, learn buying and selling. And when he returned back to Britain for some, um, should I say, recuperating exercise, he now brought all his documentations and took it to the parliament and encouraged them to ban slave trade. And actually, that also contributed to the abolition of slave trade. Are we still together here? Okay, so... Um, well, he died sick. He knew he was going to die, or maybe he didn't know, but when he was going to die, he decided he was going to pray. So he went on his knees, and he died on his knees, praying. It was a very interesting way to die. But once again, he wrote some, shall I say, death wishes, or deathbed wishes, and it was pleading for more people to come to Africa and share the gospel because he had met Africans in their raw form and he saw that this place is really a dark continent. Okay. Now, his death is a very important part of the next story. I don't have time, so much to say about the Believing Stone, but please go ahead. <laughs> the kind of pictures they use for the Africans. Oh, wow. <laughs> anyway, let's go to the last person here. And um, she's quite a very interesting figure. Mary Slessor of Calabar. Okay. Now, Mary Slessor's story is like an extension of the Belimison story because it was his death that inspired her. She read about his death wish and said, Wow. I will be a missionary, and she decided she was going to be a missionary. Interesting, it was her brother was supposed to be a missionary, but I think he died. So she had to pick it up. Let me pick her story up here, please. Mary Slessor. December 2nd, 1848, was the day of her birth? in the city of Aberdeen, that's in Scotland. Her father was a drunkard who made life miserable for his entire family. But her mother was a beautiful Christian woman who raised her children in the fear of God. Amen. Amen. Men, we must do better. Yet, some of our sufferings 
contributed to our ruggedness that made her his very successful missionary to Africa. So let's, okay, let me leave our, our childhood and move on to our adulthood because of time here. In 1874, the Christian world was profoundly moved by the news of David Livingstone's death. Everybody spoke of the great missionary hero who by his own choice had died in the jungle of Africa. Mary could no longer restrain her passion for missionary work in Africa. She confided her wish to her mother who replied, My child, I willingly let you go. You will make a fine missionary and I'm sure God will be with you. If your child tells you that he wants to be a missionary, will you answer like the mother of Mary's lesson? Or will you say, I cast out that evil spirit? You know, it's easy to celebrate heroes. Ah, she's my heroine. She's my hero. <laughs> heroes are known for their sacrifices. After some months of special training in missionary work, she was appointed for the west coast of Africa, also called the white man's grave. That's how they call the west coast of Africa. Now, there in Nigeria, they by the way, I don't know why, even till today, the Europeans and the Americans still don't see Africa as a continent. If they're coming to Togo, they say, I'm going to Africa. Togo is a country. Separate, it's a different country. From, I mean, how many countries are in Africa? I think about 56 or thereabout. They will become Africa together because once you are black, they just say, oh. and our continent is the finest and it's the most distinct. It seems to be just one whole bunch. Anyway, when she was 28 years old, she took the vow to consecrate her whole life for this part of Africa and immediately sailed from Scotland, a beloved country. She arrived about one month later to Calabar. Nigeria was part of the slave coast from which each year thousands of slaves were shipped to the west. Some of these slaves who had been sold to Jamaica. You see, there are Nigerians everywhere. Some of them have forgotten where they came from, but the slave coast in Africa, in Nigeria, in Calabar, was actually very. Have you read stories of Nigerian history and see all those Badagri, Calabar? So, we actually played a very important role also in the slave trade conversation. Okay. Now, so the mission activity that took place in Calabar was fairly successful. But interior of Calabar still remained the way it was. The description by this journal says it was a wretched and wicked Sodom where vice and evanism flourished. All the superstitions and barbarous customs of paganism were practiced. And besides, the natives learned from the depraved white people many additional criminal practices. Belief in demons was universal. I, can't, I lived in Calabar for about four years. Hi. Calabar to the suspect wish. And actually, there's a lot of witchcraft there. Actually. Um, <laughs> actually, there's a lot of witchcraft there. But there's no way there's no witchcraft, though, but you get where they do it openly. Where they say that, no matter. Believe in demons was universal witchcraft and horrible poison ordeal we practiced everywhere. Human sacrifices were offered on the river bank for success in fishing. So you want to fish, you are looking for to catch fish. You can't kill a human being and not fight. And then more importantly, in the conversation of Mary Slesor, twins were killed. Why they were killed, either killed or buried alive, was because they believed that one of them was a witch. Anybody that give out to twins, one of those twins was a witch. And since we cannot differentiate, we cannot, we don't know, so just kill the two of them. The dark continent. <laughs> Killed or buried alive. When chiefs or great men died, their wives were buried alive with them. We still do it now. We still do it. In Yoruba, we still do it. Not the wives, but many kings are not buried alone. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> we are still in that continent. Though. <laughs> That's why I, I get it when I see all those obas come to church and they sit down, give them a microphone. Hi! 
The demon where they where they, where go, where go did that church from that day. <laughs> if you know the charms that these people walk with. Amen. Amen. And do you know the logic behind that statement? When a chief or a king dies, they say that he cannot go to heaven alone. He must go with bodyguard. So they bury people alive with him. <laughs> the dark continent. <laughs> Africa, we can be extreme in everything. <laughs> God will deliver us soon, but by the gospel. It's not civilization that can deliver Africa, it's the gospel. Amen? Amen. And my students will prove that. How she was able to. A woman, 29 year old woman, fighting to abolish the kingdom. A woman. Not with guns, not with sword. With wisdom, with prayer. It says the surely Mary Slosser could not have chosen a field where missionary work was needed more than inside Calabar. The horrors of Edenism did not terrify her, since from her earliest childhood she had been in contact with vice and sin. So you get horror, you know horror which my papa. My papa is a classic drunk. He go drunk, they beat everybody for house. So she it's made her very tough. <laughs> Actually, she had red hair and blue eyes. I don't know if you can get a yeah. She must but I look like a witch too in Calabar. Like I mean natural red hair. I'm not talking about dyed hair. And blue eyes. That sounds like witchcraft. <laughs> if you don't know better. Well, she loved the African people greatly and learned the native language language epic. Abasia Nana, I think that means God is good. Abasia yeah, Yaya. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. My stepmother is from Calabar, so, and I lived there for four years too. So, my father was also a missionary to Calabar before we relocated to Lagos. So, I know a little bit of them. Anybody from Calabar here? Whatever the laugh is for, I laugh with you. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. So much to read from here, but let's just... Our first missionary work was to save the babies that were to be killed and exposed to death. She gathered and brought, out, brought them to her home, which in a short time became a veritable foundling's home. In other words, it became like an orphanage. But she succeeded in saving also many of the poor mothers who were to be killed. Because they didn't just kill the babies, they also killed the mother. Why are you giving back to a witch? The mother of a witch is also a witch. Oh, yeah. The blood on the soil of Africa is much. That's why we have no right to be blaming Igbo, say slave trade. What we have done to ourselves. Aha, uh -huh. this, 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 this is a real picture of her. Yeah. This is how she actually appeared. In real life, how many of you would like to have children like this? I know my, my, my wife is obsessed with blue eyeballs, blue, brown, any color, maybe also. But if you are going to Calabar, they may think you descended from a, a lineage. Okay, let me, let me progress here because of time. There was an interior, more interior place called Okoyang, and that place they were more. Terrible there. Yeah. Their barbarism, according to the author here, was appalling. This Okoyang, he says, <laughs> let me read it as it's written here. Menestresor and Kurt encountered a fierce and powerful tribe of the Bantu origin, lighter in color than most of the blacks in Nigeria, and of finer physique, but thoroughly degraded. Their barbarism was appalling. Head hunting was one of their favorite pursuits. I don't know. <laughs> Head hunting. Most likely refers to an obsession with cutting off heads. You just switch your head. You just switch people. Just get rid of So most likely, I, will, I didn't. I didn't research that. But most likely, if it's if it's described as barbaric, then it must have been something. He says, I don't think it was one of the favorite pursuits, and between fights, they were given to drunkenness and bloody brawls. 
It was not easy for the white woman to gain permission to settle in the territory. But in 1888, after many failed attempts, Mary Slessor boldly sailed up to cross river as far as Ekenge and begged permission of Chief, Chief Edem, to establish a mission house in his village. The chief's sister, Ma Eme, at once took a liking of her and induced her brother to permit her to live among the natives. To the end of her life, Ma Eme remained a hidden. In other words, she didn't convert, even though she supported Mary Slessor's work. So much, so much, so much to say. She suffered severely from mal malaria, by the way. Uh, malaria really dealt with her a lot. But I like some of the testimonies about her, which I want you to learn. The natives took... Okay. Let me read from this point. I'm sorry I'm rushing. Mary at once supervised the erection of a mission compound. A mud walled house was built with several stations for supplies and women and children whom she might abort. Unfortunately, the rainy season had set in so that the whole compound was soon swimming in a pool of muddy water. But Mary was not discouraged with bare feet and bare head or air having been cut short like that of the natives. She worked each day subsisting on native food, that is, she ate their food, drinking unfiltered water, getting drenched with rain and doing everything that might have killed an ordinary person. The natives took note of her for she had perfectly mastered their language. You know, some of our school of ministry students, I was asking for reports and they said, you know, it's frustrating when you are going to preach and the person does not understand English. Missionary has to advance by indigenous language. Yeah. You cannot say you're a missionary to Oyo and you're going there with uh, praise the Lord. You're wasting your time, really. So one of the first capitals for real missionary activities is learn their language. If we really want to be invested in missions, we must learn other languages. Most of the things we write on Facebook, the, the woman in the village cannot read it. What are you talking about? If you really want to save souls, you have an apostolic mentality. We must, you see, we must set up. You see, when we say apostolic culture, we don't, we don't get it yet. We must, we must begin to have language training. The way our fathers learned Greek, Latin, Hebrew, just to understand the Bible, we must begin to have those things again. Ministry is not for lazy people, no, intellectually lazy people. You learn languages just to preach the gospel. And that's what Mary Slessor did. When they fought, she became a skilled peacemaker. She would enter into the midst of their battles or into the midst of their fight and threaten them. Then when they began to laugh at her threat, she would now begin to persuade them. It was very wise. We see four people fighting the who are trying to headhunt. She would say, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will deal with you. They would not say, a woman telling. And when they start laughing, she would now begin to say, please, now don't fight, don't fight. What a wise woman. Tell the woman beside you, be wise like slaves or... Like there are ways to settle call her. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Sometimes she will scold, sometimes she will weep, sometimes she will turn her back. Sometimes she will speak with a commanding attitude which brought great awe on her audience. She was just a spectacle. I mean, I can imagine three men fighting and then the woman goes there and threatening you are fighting, I will deal with you. <laughs> and they start laughing. And when they start laughing, she will start crying. And they will just, they will be like that. This woman said, we don't understand that. <laughs> and she will from there talk. Sometimes just peace, sometimes share the gospel. Such a woman. Such a woman. Soon, the mission compound was full of children who were to be killed and their mothers driven to the bush. Each day, she scoured the woods to find babies exposed and mothers beaten and expelled from tribal town. Let me end this conversation here. We can go on and on and on and on and on. In 1891, the British government appointed her as the vice consul for Okoyong. And although she did not like the routine work connected with it, she readily accepted it because it gave her increased prestige and authority. So she could at least settle more quarrels, settle more fights. In 1894, after a service of three years as an official of the government, she wrote in her report, no tribe was formerly so feared 
because of their utter disregard for human life. But human life is now safe in Okoyong. No chief ever died without the sacrifice of many human lives. But this custom has now stopped. Some chiefs, in commenting on the wonderful chain, said, Ma, you white people are God Almighty. No other power could have done this. I mean, they saw that for you to, him to abolish <laughs> these traditions that we have been doing, you are, you are God. I mean, that, that was how much she was revered. Are we still together here? Let me just... Um, okay. Well, like I said, she died of sickness in a hut. January 13th, 1915. Her body was taken to Calabar, where she was buried on Mission Hill, a very beautiful cemetery. For 39 years, she served in Africa, bringing to the darkened country the light and life of Jesus. That is that for Church History Part 3 and the conversation we have been having throughout the month of August. Learn something tonight? It was very academic. I had to just do much, much reading, but 